second lecture on uh, radiative processes in cosmic objects. Before we go forward, a quick recap of some of the things that we uh, discussed yesterday. So we saw yesterday that uh, continuum emission processes from electromagnetic charges you know, owe their origin to acceleration of the charge. So the full electric field can be written as in two parts. This part dies down at infinity and the one containing acceleration you know, survives you know, as a energy flow to large distances. And this is what represents radiation. And Electric field has an associated magnetic, associated magnetic field, which is in the, in the line of sight vector crossed with the electric field. So in instantaneous electric field from a moving charge with a certain acceleration, the radiation field also has a very definite direction, which is provided by this vector. And so therefore, it is 100% polarized. However, when we when we look at the net polarization of radiation received from a specific source, we are averaging over electric fields produced by a large number of particles. And also for each particle, we are averaging over a finite time during which these vectors can change their orientation. And as a result of these averaging, the net polarization can be less than 100%. So this is, these are some of the key elements which we discussed yesterday. And also we'd like to remember that the, an accelerated electric charge produces a radiative power which is given by the Larmor formula, which is proportional to the charge squared times you know, the acceleration squared. This is the proper acceleration. And proper acceleration is defined at the instantaneous rest frame of the charge. So Q squared times proper acceleration squared divided by six pi epsilon zero C cube. So this is the you know, expression for the emitted power. And that's you know, how much energy the charge is losing per second. <clears throat> One, you know, quick remark at this point, and that is to do with charge in a gravitational field. So uh, if you have a charge, for example, uh, located on your table and it is stationary in a gravitational field, so that is equivalent to the charge being in a, in a constant acceleration. And uh, such a charge, according to this, must radiate. And in fact, the consensus now is that in fact it does radiate, except if the observer happens to be accelerating along with the charge, for example, if you have left the charge on the table and you are observing it, so you have the same acceleration as the charge at all times. This radiation is not visible to you, but if there is inertial observer who is freely falling in the gravitational field, to him, the charge will, appear to be radiating. And uh, similarly, a freely falling charge, which is in an inertial frame, uh, will not radiate. So uh, in a gravitational field where uh, general relativity needs to be applied, there are some uh, tricky conceptual issues, but the consensus is what I just mentioned, that a stationary charge in a gravitational field will radiate because of uh, it being in constant acceleration and a freely falling charge in a gravitational field will not radiate. All right, however, we are not going to you know, use that information for anything further in uh, the lectures to come. All right, so now we have looked at you know, the power radiated by the charge. We have looked at the polarization of the electric vector. Let us now look at you know, the spectrum. How can we describe the spectrum of the radiation that is generated by these you know, radiating charges? Now, the spectrum is nothing but the Fourier transform of the time varying electric field. If the electric field is changing with time, then we take a Fourier transform 
and uh, the composite into its frequency components, and that gives us the spectrum. Now, uh, as you have seen, the electric field is related to the acceleration, which is uh, written here as uh, rate of change of velocity v dot. So let the Fourier transform of v dot of t be v dot of omega, which is defined this way. So, you know, this is the Fourier transform definition. It's v dot of omega is defined from v dot t as one by two pi to the half minus infinity to infinity. Integral over v dot omega e to the power of minus i omega t d omega gives you v dot t. And you know, as a Fourier transform pair, v dot of omega can be derived from v dot t by a similar integral with this ne negative sign being changed to positive sign. Now, <clears throat> a Fourier transform pair like this has uh, the property of what's called power theorem or Percival theorem, where if you take the um, square integral of um, one of the members over that domain, it equals the square integral of the um, transform member in the transform domain. So um, v dot of omega squared d omega from minus infinity to infinity, um, this is omega going from minus infinity to infinity, is equal to v dot of t squared dt with t going from minus infinity to infinity. Now, <clears throat> Uh, the electric field that we're talking about uh, is uh, uh, real quantity. So uh, the uh, V dot of omega, which is the Fourier transform, is actually uh, Hermitian. And uh, so in that case, one can write this integral minus infinity to infinity as only an integral over the positive frequencies going from zero to infinity. And uh, the um, square integral from minus infinity to zero actually equals the square integral from zero to infinity. So this quantity can be written as two integral from zero to infinity, v dot of omega squared d omega. Now remember v dot of t squared is what is proportional to the power radiated. So um, uh, we will see now the um, uh, relation between spectral power and the power radiated as we described from the Lama formula. So let now let us now integrate this quantity, which is the intensity as a function of frequency over frequencies from zero to infinity. So this will then be the power radiated, which is zero to infinity q squared by six, six by epsilon zero cq two. Is two v dot omega squared, two v dot omega squared d omega. So uh, i of omega. So if I take a, a small frequency band between omega plus d omega, and if i of omega is the average uh, intensity in that interval, then i of omega is uh, uh, described as q squared by three pi epsilon zero c cubed. And so this six pi epsilon zero has become three pi epsilon zero because of this factor of two here, v dot omega squared. So, and v dot omega being the um, Fourier transform of the um, acceleration, um, of the time varying acceleration. So this is the um, spectral intensity. So um, this is how the um, intensity is distributed as a function of frequency. Now, omega is, uh, can be written as two pi times nu. Nu is uh, the um, regular frequency that we um, normally use to describe radiation. And intensity at a frequency nu, which we call a specific intensity. So this is energy. Um, so intensity is a function, um, specific intensity I nu is defined as um, energy crossing per unit area, per unit time, in the frequency range between uh, uh, nu and nu plus d nu, uh, but uh, the uh, i nu is the uh, value per uh, unit frequency. Per uh, unit solid angle. 
So uh, that is the uh, definition of specific intensity, energy crossing per unit area, per unit time, per unit frequency range, per unit solid angle. So that specific intensity, uh, if we divide by the frequency cubed, then this quantity is Lorentz invariant. So that means if we uh, are observing from a frame, uh, which is moving with respect to another frame, and if in frame one, the specific intensity we measure is I nu, then in frame two, which is moving with respect to frame one, the uh, quantity I nu or I nu prime that I will measure will be different, but the frequency nu that I measure, so it's nu prime is also different. But if we can construct the ratio of I nu by nu cube in frame one and I nu prime by nu prime cube in frame two, those quantities will be the same. So that's what uh, one means by this uh, relation of Lorentz invariance. And this I nu therefore describes the spectrum of the radiation. Now again, just as we mentioned about polarization, spectrum emitted by a single particle is not what we directly see from a source, astronomical source, because that source will have many, many particles in it. So the radiation received from a source is a sum of emission from a large population of particles. Now this large population of particles, not all of them will have the same energy, not all of them will have the same acceleration. So therefore, the distribution of particles in energy space shape the spectrum that the object emits. And we will see examples of it as we go along. Now the energy distribution of particles, now one of the energy distributions that is commonly encountered in many cases is that when the energy distribution of particles can be described by a thermal distribution, and the thermal distribution is, in fact, a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of energies uh, of the energies of the particles, right? So, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution is a single parameter distribution uh, which uh, has a temperature T. Uh, and the normalization of the distribution is decided by the total number of particles that are uh, present in the distribution. So uh, if we plot, for example, log of the number of particles versus log of energy, then the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution would look like this red line, where the uh, number of particles peaks around uh, this energy is unit in units of kt. So it peaks around uh, uh, energy equal to kt. And then it uh, drops quite sharply. And the uh, energy dispersion drops also at lower energies. So there is a peak at the intermediate value, which is close to the uh, energy kt, and then it drops on both sides. The, the drop at higher energies is no, quite sharp and it's somewhat less sharp at low energies. So the <coughs> Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of energy, energies has a characteristic value which is given by the temperature. Now in astrophysics, we will also encounter distributions which do not quite have such a characteristic energy. And uh, the energy distribution looks somewhat like this uh, straight line in log log uh, diagram that I have drawn here. So uh, this is called a power law distribution. And clearly this distribution cannot be reproduced by any thermal uh, distribution of particles because 
any thermal distribution of each particle you take, whether it is at this temperature or at a higher temperature or at a lower temperature, it will all have always have a characteristic maximum and drop on both sides. But not, it will never produce a you know, power law distribution like this. So a power law distribution of this kind uh, is uh, often referred to as a non-thermal distribution. So we will talk about particle energy distributions that we encounter in uh, astronomy uh, into these two classes. Uh, one is thermal distribution, another is a non-thermal distribution. So thermal distribution will always follow a Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, shape, whereas non-thermal distribution can be anything which is non-Maxwellian, power law being an example. And it is this distribution of uh, energies of particles, which will then decide what kind of radiation spectrum the source produces when we add the emission from all these particles which are present. We will now go to uh, another uh, aspect of radiation that we see. We have been talking about radiation emitted by single uh, charged particles like single electrons. And then we say that the source will emit something which is you know, a collection of emission from many electrons. And you know, that emission is what you will see if you're located just next to the source. But the source can be far away from us. And you know, as the radiation propagates from the source to us, the material intervening between the source and us can further modify the character of the radiation. And what we see here, we will have these modifications already imposed on the radiation that we see. So therefore we need to understand what kind of modification that the intervening medium has done so that we can uh, reconstruct what kind of radiation the source would have emitted and it is the uh, radiation that the source would have emitted uh, contains the information about the source itself. So if we want to st study the source, we would like to um, unfold the effects of the propagation of radiation through matter. So uh, <clears throat> let us look at certain uh, effects that we come across in astrophysics. Uh, let's look at plasma effects to start with. So uh, the large part of the material in the universe is in ionized state and in a, they can be described as plasmas. And radiation propagating through these plasmas a, are dispersed. That is the phase velocity of the wave a, is not the same value at all frequencies. And a, for a, a standard, a, plasma material, the phase velocity in units of C can be written as one minus omega P squared over omega squared to the power of minus half. This is for a regular collisionless non-magnetic plasma or the magnetic field being small. So this omega P is the plasma frequency, which is related to the density of the plasma. And of course, the mass of the charged particles and so on. But it's, you know, omega p changes if you, you know, change the density of material in the, in the plasma. So when omega is close to omega p, so let's say if omega is less than omega p, then you can see that this quantity becomes imaginary. And if, excuse me, if uh, phase velocity becomes imaginary, that means the propagation is stopped and the uh, radiation is absorbed by the system. So uh, when the frequency of the wave that is generated has to propagate through a plasma whose plasma frequency is higher than the frequency of that wave, then that wave will not be received by the observer. So, uh, <clears throat> So close to the plasma frequency, you have a large cutoff. As the frequency rises 
from below plasma frequency to uh, higher than plasma frequency the phase velocity also will uh, change very quickly and when omega is very much larger than the plasma frequency then uh, the phase velocity becomes almost equal to the speed of light and the dependence on frequency becomes very small because you know, once you know, omega omega p squared by omega squared is already very close to zero then you know, v phase by c it stays close to 1 irrespective irrespective of omega so you know, nevertheless you know, around the plasma frequency you know, and even to you know, some higher values of frequency you do have a frequency dependent phase velocity and which causes dispersion so therefore if you have radiation produced over a range of frequencies by the source and when you observe this radiation different frequencies would have taken different times to travel through the medium because its phase velocity is different so the radiation will be received at different times so for example if the radiation from the source happens to be a sudden spike of radiation then that spike or pulse will be received by the observer at different times at different frequencies at higher frequency it will be received earlier and as you go to lower and lower frequency it will be received at later and later time because phase velocity becomes smaller and smaller as omega approaches Uh, omega p from the higher side so uh, this dispersion can actually be measured in uh, various types of sources including radio pulsars and uh, using this um, measurement of dispersion one is able to characterize the plasma that uh, intervenes the uh, or that pervades the medium which uh, is intervening between us and the source now in the presence of the magnetic field the phase velocity splits into two components for two different types of polarization if it is right circularly polarized radiation propagating through electron plasma then the phase velocity is uh, given by 1 minus omega p square divided by omega times omega plus omega b where omega b is the cyclotron resonant frequency so in cgs units it is given as the electron charge e times the magnetic field b divided by mass of the electron me times you know, speed of light c so eb over me c is the you know, you know, value of omega b uh, written in uh, cgs units so uh, omega times omega plus omega b is the phase velocity uh, of uh, the right circularly polarized radiation and omega minus omega b is the uh, phase velocity of the left circularly polarized radiation so now you can see that the two polarizations will propagate through the medium at two different speeds and this difference in speed is dependent on the frequency of the radiation so let us say the radiation that is produced initially is linearly polarized now linearly polarized radiation can be decomposed into no two components one is right circularly polarized one is left circularly polarized so once such a radiation is incident on this plasma the right circularly polarized component will propagate at a different speed than the left circularly polarized component and then when they arrive at the observer the right circularly polarized radiation would have arrived at a different phase compared to the left circularly polarized radiation and then when you combine them and then produce and reconstruct the linear polarization at the at the observer the result of this phase difference between right circularly polarized and left circularly polarized components is that 
the net polarization plane of polarization would have rotated and this you know, effect is called faraday rotation and you know, clearly the extent of faraday rotation is related to this omega b and as omega b is proportional to the magnetic field strength so therefore you know, if we are able to study this faraday rotation and you know, since this is the function function of wave you know, wavelength or frequency you know, we can measure this you know, effect of faraday rotation you know, by you know, taking the polarization angle at different frequencies which would have rotated by different amounts and from that we can reconstruct the magnetic field in the medium in the line of sight so you know, faraday rotation gives us way of measuring the magnetic field effective magnetic field between the um, um, source and the observer in the line of sight so these are certain types of um, plasma effects which um, uh, modify the radiation as it propagates through um, matter there is um, uh, another effect which can even induce polarization in the um, uh, incoming radiation for example if it is optical radiation and you have dust grains in the intervening matter as the radiation let us say the incident radiation was unpolarized and it is incident on a dust grain which is elongated the property of the dust grains is such that it absorbs the radiation the which is polarized parallel to the uh, principal axis of the dust and the perpendicular to the incident uh, axis, axis of the dust differently so uh, as a result when the radiation propagates through this dust grain it would have uh, predominant would be predominantly left with one uh, primary axis of polarization whereas the dust grain itself can produce its own uh, uh, infrared radiation when it is heated and that will have a polarization which will be uh, parallel to its principal axis so uh, you have the incident radiation passing through the dust grain and surviving with a um, polarization which is perpendicular to the principal axis and the radiation produced by the dust itself will have a polarization parallel to the dust, you know, principal axis of the dust grain as long as the dust grain is very elongated like this one in the picture and you know, so you know, this type of effect can actually induce polarization in the emission that we receive although the incident radiation which is generated at the source is unpolarized and the dust not only does uh, impose polarization it of course also absorbs this radiation and the uh, amount of absorption as a function of wavelength for a typical uh, uh, distribution of dust grains in our galaxy is shown here this is wavelength in microns and this is the uh, extinction coefficient uh, uh, which is the logarithm of the amount of absorption and you can see that you have a strongly wavelength dependent behavior over here this is one by wavelength by the way it's one by wavelength in micron so as you go this way you go from infrared to ultraviolet and the absorption in the ultraviolet is very very strong and it is so strong that for example if you have let us say an incident radiation which is uh, which has a spectrum as uh, shown by this broken power law over here this is a log flux and uh, this is log frequency at uh, regions far away from the influence of the dust grains you more or less receive what uh, is incident which is in this region and this region however where the dust grains uh, absorb radiation 
you can have a very very deep absorption and particularly in extreme ultraviolet you do not receive any radiation at all from anything which is uh, even uh, a few kiloparsecs away in the galactic plane so uh, in the extreme ultraviolet our view is very very local whereas in, uh, in uh, other wavelength regions one can see farther away because the dust grains in the uh, distributed in the interstellar medium in our own galaxy uh, are not so uh, strongly absorbing at uh, other frequencies okay so uh, we see that uh, material in general when in radiation is incident on it it can uh, absorb that radiation the material uh, has a finite uh, temperature and has its uh, own emissivity so the material can also add radiation to the uh, line of sight so uh, the net result of propagation of radiation through matter can be captured in a simple uh, uh, equation like this which is called the radiative transfer equation which describes the change in intensity where i nu is the specific intensity d i nu is the change in that specific intensity over a length ds along the line of sight so ds along the you know, along the propagation direction so di nu ds is the you know, rate of change of specific intensity you know, along the line of sight and it is related to the following some amount of this you know, radiation i nu can be absorbed by the material which is present in this in a length ds and that is given as minus alpha nu times i nu times ds so it's a fraction alpha nu that is absorbed so fraction alpha nu ds is absorbed over a length ds and since this is absorbed there is a negative sign here so di nu ds due to absorption alone can be written as minus alpha nu i nu and the amount of radiation that is added by the material that is present over this uh, length ds is its emission coefficient j nu times ds so di nu ds can therefore be uh, written as the absorption component which is minus alpha nu i nu where alpha nu is called the absorption coefficient and plus j nu where j nu is called the emission coefficient so this is our basic radiative transfer equation which describes how the uh, intensity is modified by the material we normally rewrite this by redefining uh, the uh, quantity in the denominator s and s was a uh, physical length of propagation so we write uh, this quantity d tau nu a tau nu is now called optical depth as alpha nu times ds so you divide this expression by alpha nu then you are left with d i nu d tau nu is now minus i nu plus j nu by alpha nu the ratio of j nu by alpha nu is referred to as a source function s nu so this quantity is a property a specific property of the source itself because j nu is the emission coefficient of the source alpha nu is the absorption coefficient of the source and the ratio of these two is a specific property of the source and this is called a source function so d i nu d tau nu is then minus i nu plus s nu what is the solution of this if this solution of this can be written as i nu being equal to i nu 0 which is the background radiation which is incident No. so i nu 0 is the value of the intensity at tau nu equal to 0 so i nu 0 e to the power of minus tau nu plus s nu times 1 minus e to the power of minus tau nu that's a simple in a solution of this radiative transfer equation now this 
uh, deceptively simple looking equation can uh, guide us over a very large variety of situations in uh, describing the radiation that we receive in, in uh, astrophysics. So let's uh, understand this a little better. What is S nu? The S nu, as I said, is the ratio of emission coefficient to absorption coefficient. Now by Kirchhoff's law, the, in the ratio of emission coefficient to absorption coefficient for a thermal source is known to be equal to the Planck function B nu evaluated at the temperature at which the source is. For B nu, the expression for that is 2H nu cubed by C squared, one, minus, one, one divided by e to the power of H nu by kT minus one. This is the Planck function. And S nu for a thermal source is always equal to the Planck function, no matter what the source is made of, what material the source is made of. It could be made of hydrogen, it could be made of iron, it could be solid, it could be ga gaseous, it could be liquid. So uh, if it happens to be a thermal source, it's S nu will always be equal to B nu. Now, knowing that, we can uh, first take a look at how this blackbody function looks like. So the blackbody function, if we plot log intensity as a function of frequency, then the blackbody function has this peak, which is roughly at you know, h nu of the order of kt. And you know, then it drops off on either side, just as I was mentioning about Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, it has a peak in the near in the energy of the order of kt, and then it drops off on both sides. The blackbody function also has a similar overall bell-shaped nature. Of course, the expression itself is somewhat different, but in the, the overall bell-shaped nature is similar. Now, this is a function which is unique for a given temperature. Let's go back. So the only parameter in this uh, definition of the Planck function is temperature. There's nothing else. Nu is the independent variable and everything else is a constant. So we can uh, just uh, compare this blackbody functions at different temperatures by just plotting them. And as one can see, as one moves from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, the location of the peak, of course, keeps moving up because uh, the location of the peak is near H nu of the order of kT. So uh, as kT goes up, the corresponding H nu also must go up. So the uh, peak keeps moving rightwards. But the total area of the function also increases. It increases in such a way that a function at higher temperature always completely envelopes the function at a lower temperature. So there is no, no, no crossing point between the two blackbody curves at two different temperatures. So no, if you now look at the no, total area no, encompassed by these curves. Clearly, at a higher temperature, the total area encompassed is in a larger than the, at a lower temperature. And if you carry out the integration, you will find that the area encompassed, which is a, proportional to the total energy in, in, emitted, or also the total energy density in the, in, a, in the black body, it is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So you know, the area under this curve is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So the total you know, area, which is you know, proportional to the total flux, the total luminosity of the black body, or you know, also the you know, total energy density. So that goes as you know, temperature to the power of four. Now, let's go back to the you know, radiative transfer equation. 
we have i nu is equal to i nu zero e to the power minus tau nu plus s nu times one minus e to the power minus tau nu. If tau nu happens to be very very large, then e to the power minus tau nu is close to zero. So if the source has a very large optical depth, we actually see no evidence of this radiation. background radiation impinging from the source from behind it so that gets totally absorbed however this term gives this quantity to be negligible and it is it converges to i nu equal to s nu so when optical depth is very large optical depth tending to infinity i nu becomes equal to s nu and if the source happens to be thermal then that i nu will become equal to b nu or the planck function so these black body curves actually represent the emission from a thermal source when that thermal source is optically very very thick if optical depth is not very large but um, um, small let us say less than 1 then you can see that um, you will not only see some part of the background radiation leaking through the source now even if the background radiation happens to be zero so we are only looking at the self radiation from the um, object then you will have s nu times 1 minus e to the power of minus tau nu which is less than s nu so the emission will be less than the maximum value that you got when tau nu is equal to infinity so and when the tau nu is very small much smaller than 1 then you can just write this e to the power of minus tau nu as 1 minus tau nu so this quantity will become just s nu times tau nu so when the tau nu is very small then the intensity becomes proportional to the optical depth and the source function and when the optical depth becomes very large i nu just becomes a source function so if a source happens to be optically thick at certain frequencies but not so optically thick at some other frequencies then if the source is thermal then what we can state is that the spectrum of the source will be fully contained within the black body curve at that temperature at frequencies where the uh, optical depth is very high the emission will touch the black body curve at frequencies where the optical depth is not very large and small the uh, emission will drop below the black body curve and now the exact nature of the spectrum can then be just uh, described by the behavior of optical depth as a function of frequency right so uh, wherever optical depth is small you will uh, depart from this black body curve and come below and when optical depth is large you will just hug this black body curve in the spectrum so um, optical depth in general is frequency dependent so um, a source could be optically thick at some frequencies optically thin at others and that will in, in general give you the you know, shape of the spectrum so we need to find how the optical depth of the source varies as a function of frequency and um, for example um, if the optical depth is more or less low at all frequencies but at some very small region a very small range of frequencies optical depth happens to become very large then you will have the radiation following some curve which is below this black body curve and then at that very narrow range of frequencies the optical depth will shoot up and the emission will reach the closer to the black body curve and after that it will fall off again because it's over a very narrow frequency range again so this 
kind of structure will then look like a spectral line, an emission line uh, above the um, optically thin emission which you are otherwise seeing. So if the source is optically thin, then um, uh, at specific resonant frequencies where the optical depth um, uh, assumes a higher value, you will see emission lines um, on the spectrum. Here is a um, uh, about the best measured black body spectrum, which is the um, cosmic microwave black body spectrum. Uh, um, and this is a black body at um, uh, 2.73 Kelvin. The error bars here are highly magnified compared to the um, uh, actual measurements. So the error bars are very, very tiny actually. So um, <clears throat> this is about the most perfect black body that um, uh, one has measured in nature. So uh, just to uh, recall some of the things we just said, the so black body constitutes the maximum emission by a thermal source at a given temperature. Uh, when uh, I look at frequencies well below the um, maximum, that is H nu much less than KT, then the Planck function can be written approximately as Two nu squared kt by c squared. This is called the Rayleigh's regime. So, in that regime, let the background temperature, the intensity of the background, be described by background temperature T B G, which is c squared i nu zero divided by two nu squared k. And we define a brightness temperature, which is the actual intensity that we see i nu times c squared divided by two nu squared k. So we uh, call that a brightness temperature. Then this uh, radiative transfer solution can be written as the uh, brightness temperature being equal to the temperature of the source plus uh, e to the power minus tau nu times the difference between the background temperature and the source temperature. And this lies between the value of the background temperature and source temperature. If the source temperature happens to be less than background temperature, then you see a uh, see an absorption. So you see um, background and uh, so where uh, the source is not present, you see the background and where the source is present, you see a lower intensity. So you see the source in absorption. On the other hand, if uh, temperature of the source is larger than background, then if you go off source, you see the background and when you come on source, you see an emission which is higher than the background temperature. So you see the source in, source in emission. And as I just mentioned, spectral lines correspond to the optical depth tau nu being high over a narrow frequency range. Okay, so this is as far as uh, I will proceed today. So we learned today how to describe the propagation of radiation through matter uh, via uh, radiative transfer equation and uh, how for thermal remission, the black body at uh, the temperature of the material provides the maximum envelope of the spectrum and the uh, spectrum actually produced by the source depending on the optical depth will either hug the black body spectrum at the temperature or fall below it. And if you have a background radiation at certain temperature T and the source foreground source at the background temperature at a certain temperature BG and the source at a temperature T, then if temperature T happens to be smaller than the temperature of the background, then the source is seen in absorption. And if the temperature T happens to be larger than the temperature of the background, then the source is seen in emission over the background. So um, uh, that is the summary of um, what we have discussed today. So I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you, Deepankar. Uh, so if you have, if you had questions and you wrote them during the lecture, please raise your hands. Uh, there is one question from someone whose mic is not working. So I'll just read it out. Uh, Sriraj Warrior. He asks, isn't plasma a nonlinear medium 
So won't it induce nonlinear effects? And what are these nonlinear effects? Yeah, so plasma is a nonlinear medium, and it depends on the amplitude of perturbation that you subject the plasma to. With small small perturbations, the plasma will behave linearly. When the when the perturbation amplitude is large, you will get nonlinear effects. What we are talking about here is just the propagation of electromagnetic waves through the plasma. If Uh, the uh, wave electric field amplitude is extremely large then uh, you can induce uh, uh, non linear effects in the plasma and uh, so that has uh, uh, all kinds of uh, physical effects which uh, you particularly see in laboratory plasma uh, but uh, in uh, as to physical case we will be mostly dealing with uh, the linear range of propagation of radiation uh, through uh, electromagnetic radiation through the plasma so we will not be dealing with those uh, nonlinear effects uh, which uh, which can have to do with uh, stimulated emission which can have uh, landau damping uh, all of those things we will not be dealing with very commonly but uh, but those effects can occur in specific situations in astrophysics okay so we have a question from himadri saha i have unmuted you please ask hello sir hello my question is sir uh, in a shuna diagram uh, due to dust excitation there is some polarization induced yes so my question is uh, how is the dust is producing its own infrared radiation and uh, why is it like the optical is perpendicular to the infrared radiation yeah so that's the property of the dust grain so the dust grains are um, made of crystalline material and uh, and if their shape is not spherical but uh, highly elongated like i've shown in this diagram then the incident radiation is preferentially absorbed in the direction in, in, uh, which is uh, parallel to the dust grain parallel to the principal axis of the dust grain so more of that radiation is absorbed than the polarization which is perpendicular to it so when the radiation escapes you are left with a residual polarization which is perpendicular to the principal axis of the dust grain now the dust grain can have can produce its own radiation of course even if there is no background radiation falling on it if the dust grain has its own temperature then it will produce its own thermal radiation and that thermal radiation and wherever the absorption is maximum emission is also going to be maximum in in, uh, in those in those modes which is again related to kirchhoff of law as i said the uh, ratio of the emission coefficient to absorption coefficient at the given temperature is in, uh, in, uh, given by the planck function so uh, uh, wherever the absorption is more the emission is also more so the, since the absorption is more along the principal axis of the dust grain emission is also be more along the principal axis of the dust grain and so the self radiation of the dust grain will be polarized parallel to the principal axis okay so there have been several questions asking for references where they can see derivations of various equations i guess this is mainly rebicki and lightman mentioned in the slides yes uh, is there any so, other reference which you would like to yeah, so the two two references in, uh, in, uh, which people can look at one is uh, rebicki and lightman radiative processes in astrophysics and uh, malcolm long air high energy astrophysics and i guess both of these are mentioned in the slides at some both point. of these are mentioned in the slides as we go along we will see more of them so we have one question from yashodhan joshi uh, i have unmuted you uh, hello sir hello sir in the starting you said that in a gravitation field uh, if a charge is in non inertial frame then an inertial observer will see it radiating emission but if the yes. observer is in the same frame as the charge he will not see the radiation that is now right. radiation will take energy along with him so how will yes. the observer in the uh, frame same as charge will explain that or observe that because he won't see the radiation right yes he will not see the radiation but uh, the definition of total energy in general relativity is a complicated business 
So the total energy it depends on how you define it. It's still conserved, but uh, the energy is coming out of the gravitational field. When you um, see um, when a um, um, uh, uh, um, freely falling observer sees uh, radiation from the charge which is held static in that gravitational field, the energy is being actually derived out of the gravitational field, and the um, one at rest with respect to the charge that is. Um, uh, accelerated in exactly the same way uh, will uh, not be able to detect that radiation and will also not uh, uh, detect any change in energy but this is because also the uh, definition of total energy in these two uh, in these two frames can be different so how you measure energy how you what your zero point in energy is is also different in general relativity between different frames so uh, that is why No, uh, it may sound paradoxical, but the principle actually applies. You know, the the general principle, as I mentioned. Okay, so next we have uh, Bashali Mondal. I've unmuted you. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. My question is: What are the dust shown in the pictures of nebulae or galaxy, and what what are the effects they have? so uh, dust particles are small crystalline uh, condensations of material uh, which uh. are found uh, in uh, in diffuse gas mixed with diffuse gas so when you have uh, uh, so your diffuse gas has uh, many elements including heavy elements all the way up to iron and uh, when this gas is shielded from radiation and is cooled to low temperatures because if you shield gas from radiation in interstellar space it can cool down to very low temperatures so in such low temperatures some of these heavier elements condense into crystalline form and produce these dust grains and so they can have shapes of various kind largely elongated so that's what is responsible for this polarization so so that's what dust grains are now dust grains are present everywhere that there is cold gas in galaxies in interstellar medium wherever there is cold gas dust grain is usually mixed with it when uh, um, either uh, when it comes in the vicinity of either a hot gas or uh, radiation from a star dust grains tend to get destroyed so you will uh, over time long exposure to ultraviolet radiation from a star will uh, destroy and evaporate dust grains and so is uh, if you uh, put the dust grain in, in a, a, a hot gas uh, which is also present in some parts of the interstellar medium and uh, for example the, the dust grains encounter shocked gas you know, there is supernova explosion and shocked gas you know, is generated and dust grains are embedded in it and the dust grains will evaporate so you know, these things destroy dust grains on the other hand when a molecular cloud you know, keeps becoming denser under its own gravity and keeps cooling down it generates dust grains inside it so you know, so yeah so, you know, the dust grains are present and they do you know, have a role in the thermal balance you know, of the you know, of the interstellar gas dust grains can show up in absorption like in the horsehead nebula which i showed yesterday dust grains can also show up as strong infrared emitters from galaxies where particularly dust grains are being heated by newly formed stars and the dust grains are radiating their own infrared radiation they can have a very large infrared luminosity that they can produce of these galaxies so strong infrared luminous galaxies are signatures of newly forming stars in these galaxies so so this is all i can say at the moment about dust grains but of course there is 
more to it, but we will not go to go any further deep in these lectures. Okay, so we'll take one last question from the Zoom, uh, and then maybe you can look at the YouTube chat. Sure. So we have a question from Priyanka B. I've unmuted you. Hello, sir. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My question is, while studying the polarimetry data, uh, we get information regarding the magnetic field components and also the electric field components. So in addition to the information on rotation from the cosmic objects, what additional information can the magnetic field components give? I'm not sure I fully understood your question. What you measure in a typical detector, oh, yeah. the electric field that you receive. Oh, in I fact, the magnetic field, which is in the part of the radiation, oh. is very hard to detect because uh, there is a you know, one V by C factor, which multiplies the you know, ability for us to detect this. You know, uh, um, magnetic field. But largely, all our detectors are tuned to detecting the electric field uh, coming from the source. Okay. So we detect our polarization that way, right? Okay. Now, what I mentioned is the magnetic field that is present in the interstellar medium, in the medium through which the um, uh, radiation is propagating. Okay. And radiation propagating through such a medium can rotate the plane of polarization. Okay. So the plane of electric polarization, and you can measure that oh. rotation, and that can give us an estimate of the magnetic field distribution in the interstellar medium. Okay. Now I will talk about you know, uh, generation of radiation in magnetic field as well, uh, and there are mechanisms which will produce polarized radiation right at the source uh, due to the presence of magnetic field. But that is a subject of a future lecture, so we will. Uh, you know, discuss that when we come to it. Thank you, sir. Okay, so maybe we can just, uh, you can just take a quick look at the yeah. chat. So I see the first question. In plasma, there is always magnetic field. So how this dispersion formula can be applied for studying plasma effects? Should we use Faraday rotation formula always? Yes. So. All these depends on at what frequency range you're in. So uh, magnetic field sets a frequency scale which is uh, related to omega b. Plasma um, uh, is, um, uh, own uh, um, uh, density and so on um, uh, sets a frequency scale which is omega p. If you happen to be close to omega p but far away from omega b, then no, mostly the regular plasma effects will apply. On the other hand, in case you are close to omega b rather than omega p, the magnetic field effects or the Faraday rotation effects will dominate. In general, there is a combined effect. So you get a hybrid frequencies combining both plasma and cyclotron resonant frequencies. And you have a more complex dispersion relation and you can derive the uh, propagation law for uh, such uh, general cases. And uh, one would be able to uh, probe both the plasma density and the magnetic field uh, by uh, studying the propagation as a function of frequency in those regimes. So uh, in general, both effects are present and uh, they can be studied in a combined manner. But often what you see is that the frequency scales are very different. So close to plasma frequency, we can simply forget about magnetic field and apply the plasma dispersion. And near the resonant frequency, we can observe the Faraday rotation and don't worry too much about the dispersion effect. But both will always be present. So we Second had one question. person. Uh, well, we had one person who had asked question and only just raised their hand. Uh, so maybe I can okay. unmute. Sure, sure. Uh, it's Suprabha Mukhopadhyay. I've unmuted you now. Sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes. 
uh, in the relation for the uh, dispersion due to the plasma uh, dispersion effect due to plasma uh, we have phase velocity is equals to uh, phase velocity by c is equals to uh, this expression but uh, that expression is uh, greater than c when omega p is in between 0 and omega then phase velocity will be greater than uh, speed of light is that possible by yes, yes. oh absolutely phase velocity is greater than speed of light so therefore group velocity is less than the speed of light and you know, the energy is propagating at group velocity which will always propagate at you know, speed less than the speed of light so uh, okay so phase velocity will have to be higher than the speed of light okay so that's it from the zoom if you want to take the other youtube question yeah, so let me let me just take the if uv gets absorbed by dust so much so in that uv coming from far away gets absorbed how to observe uv light coming from agents and quasars this extreme ultraviolet from agents and quasars you cannot see no matter what you do so you observe this in these regions you observe in these regions where the absorption is still within limits so the object gets fainter and fainter as we approach this cut off but you can observe this part you can observe this part which is soft x rays so all of this is uv this is soft x rays this is euv extreme ultraviolet you cannot observe you know, the, in uh, distant galaxies and quasars at that wavelength i'm afraid now if there is void or space can we measure temperature at that point temperature corresponds to material so in, uh, in, uh, if we can go back what is in, uh, the meaning of temperature when you're talking about let's say a gas so the uh, gas particles are moving randomly with certain speeds and if the distribution of these speeds uh, are described if the distribution of the speeds is described by a maxwellian distribution uh, for a given temperature t then we can assign a temperature t to that gas that is all that we can say about temperature if there is empty space or vacuum there is no material so therefore we, we do not have anything to ascribe the temperature to in, uh, in uh, cosmic space of course there is nothing which is uh, purely void or uh, devoid of material even when Uh, the gas density is very small there is still a certain small amount of gas and it will have its own temperature and then the whole universe is bathed in radiation and we can assign temperature to radiation as well and uh, the cosmic background radiation uh, the spectrum of which i uh, just mentioned uh, is the radiation that pervades the entire universe so uh, if you go to any region of the universe which is devoid of anything else at least that radiation is present and you know, if you have a detector you will be able to detect you know, you know, that radiation temperature in in that region so i think i'll uh, conclude you know, taking questions with these yes, three that's fine that's fine okay. we can stop for today <laughs>